Uh, now, when my father got invited to write Traffic in Towns, this is what he saw as the main choices, and I think he got them broadly right. Um, this was in 1963, so a long time ago. Uh, there was a forecast then of 30 million <coughs> cars by 2010. That was a slight underestimate. There were actually 31 million by 2007. So he, he substantially underestimated the car ownership. has gone up even faster than he projected, and his projections were pretty exciting. The choices he saw as having to be made were those between the extent to which you could adapt the town to accommodate the traffic and the parking, and of course, somewhere like St Ives, you can't adapt it very much at all. Um, but places like Coventry, you could adapt enormously. Even London, you could adapt enormously. Um, and the extent to which you could reduce people's reliance on the car by having alternatives. Uh, better public transport, the obvious alternative, uh, but bicycling, an alternative, uh, and the extent to which you could control the car use by things like parking control and pricing. So that's how he saw the issues, and I think he got it broadly right. There's one or two he didn't mention, I'll come back to those. Uh, and against that, he said, in each case, what's going to be the impact on the environment? Is the town going to be worth living in, or is it going to be like totally car-dominated? Um, there, was of course, there were, of course, a number of unforeseen dimensions to the problem, which I don't think my father really was interested in or had time to explore. Um, the first of these was that the car isn't just the sort of thing that gets used a lot, it actually completely changes the shape of the towns. And this shows what has happened to Luton. I think I've got one for Exeter as well in a minute. Um, but you can see in 1920, Luton was quite a small town on the railway, um, and Dunstable was another much smaller town quite a long distance away from Luton. So they were completely separate, very little interchange between them, perhaps market days. Um, in the next one down, by 1946, Luton has grown enormously, and Dunstable is still almost the same. There is a railway between them at that point, Shut down now. Now a busway. So by 46, uh, they're more connected, probably buses. By 63, the, the developers actually joined the two together in a rather spindly way, but it's done. And by 94, it's basically become one large, sprawling town. So basically, you can't stand still with the car. Whatever happens, it's going to push development in all sorts of ways, which planners may not necessarily want. Uh, so if it doesn't do that, it'll push them into high rise, which planners can uh, just about live with. Uh, but it's an interesting case, and that is uh, in a very short time we're talking about that change, absolutely colossal changes. Um, oh, well, this is local. This is where I lived, uh, Exeter. You can see what Exeter was like a sort of at the end of the war, had its railways, I had a port. Exmouth was a tiny little seaside place. We used to go there for holidays. Um, uh, and here it is uh, more recently. I, I, again, I haven't got the date. It's got its bypass just, only going halfway round it. Um, and the town has expanded very substantially. So again, and it's sprawled. It's basically sprawled out. And it's that sprawling again, which is a feature of what the car does to towns, whether you like it or not, it will uh, end up increasing the size of the area the town covers. Um, next one. Is. And the other great dimension to the traffic problem is, of course, climate change. Now, everybody thinks recently that it's, it's all over, and there was some argument about it, and uh, a lot of people said, oh, it's just a joke, not happening at all. Uh, and uh, we've just had all this rain, so it must be all right now. But, uh, to my mind, it is happening, and it's happening extremely fast in geological time terms. If you remember what a winter was like when you were young, as I do, uh, I can remember uh, tobogganing down our local road in Surbiton, where we lived immediately after the war. Uh, so climate has undoubtedly changed, and is changing incredibly fast incredibly fast. 
It's not going to happen in our lifetime, but in our grandchildren's lifetime, there will be major changes. That diagram below just shows the various mechanisms which are driving it. Uh, and uh, they show, I think, somewhere that the car is a major cause of it and how it goes up and settles in the upper atmosphere. Uh, you get all sorts of other undesirable things deposited up there like aerosols and so on. So it's a, basically a picture we don't have to worry about much, but our future generations are certainly going to have to clean it up somehow. And I don't know how they'll do it. As far as the CO2 emissions go, which are made the major part of climate change, uh, the car is far and away the biggest cause. It's generating about 32% of the total. So it is the car or the motor vehicle that is driving it. Um, the next biggest one is actually industry. Uh, and then the third one is domestic. You and I in our houses. Uh, in my case, having log fires every night. Uh, in other cases, putting on the gas or electricity. So um, it's uh, happening, and it's happening in geological terms incredibly fast. So there will be repercussions. Um, now the other thing um, of relevance uh, is that when I was at university, we had this strange Don who used to come in uh, with a little red book and wave it at us and say, you should read this. And it wasn't the thoughts of Chairman Mao, which we didn't intend reading. It was a book called The Industrial Revolution. And he said, you must all read this book. Because if you read it, you will understand what the Industrial Revolution did to this country. Because it transformed it very rapidly uh, into somewhere completely, into the heart of industry, heart of the industrial world. So it had a gigantic effect. And his message was, if you think that was a gigantic effect, then you should be aware that the new one, the next industrial revolution, is going to be far faster and far greater in its impact. We took no notice of this, whatever. Um, but I was, it immediately came back to me, because my first job as a consultant was in the birthplace of the industrial revolution, uh, Ironbridge, or Colebrookdale, where, of course, they first... Uh, used coal for firing uh, steam engines and so on. So um, I then got to thinking about it quite a bit and have done ever since. Now my father, meanwhile, uh, Colebrookdale reminds me, had built his second caravan and was busy taking holidays all over Britain and all over the continent we had to go dragging this caravan, which he'd made himself. He was a good carpenter. Um, I was confined to a tent outside, you can just see it in the back. Um, so he was uh, sort of following this, but I don't think he ever understood the climate change dimension to the problem. Uh, he understood air pollution, but not climate change. Um, right, so now we start on the rail transport and begin with that lovely thing, the bus. How many people have been on bus today? Anybody? Ah, oh, one. Good, well done. You should get a prize for that. <laughs> anyway, I was roughly right in my estimate of the numbers. Uh, now, the bus has gone un undergone a transformation, of course. This industry has been privatised, taken away from the nationalised industry, and the whole lot privatised. Hundreds of millionaires were created in that process. But uh, for all these changes, a bus is still a bus. Um, it's still got to... You still have to wait for it to stop. You've got to walk to the stop. Uh, when you get to the stop, you've got to make sure you get on the right bus. And when you try and get on the bus, you've got to, go to get the right money out. There's a long hassle while you do try and get change from the driver. And he says, we don't give change on this bus, you pick it off. And you say, well, I can't get off, there won't be another bus for 20 minutes. So he then sorts to see if you've got any change. And so it goes on. It's a clumsy process, getting on and off the bus. Uh, but it can be done. And in most parts of the country, it's the only form of public transport. What can you do to improve buses? Well, there is this brilliant initiative from the Germans. We have to, no, maybe the Dutch, I think it's Germans. Uh, it's a fantastic, clever idea. We'll put it on rails like a train. Uh, so you don't actually put it on rails, you just put a couple of planks beside the track, and the bus runs on the uh, railway track. And now the great advantage of this, uh, it's a very important one, is that the driver can then take his hands off the steering wheel. He can sit like that. I'm, somebody else is steering the bus. 
So it's a pretty important technical development. Uh, well, I'm joking, but it does actually have quite an important effect because it makes the bus appear like a train and it, it gets the reliability of a train. Uh, so it's not entirely stupid as an idea. It's not such a good idea as it's cracked up to be. But if you're offered one, I would take it. Not if it involved closing your railway down there. But if you've got the buses off the streets, it would be quite good. Um, now, one thing I've learned, as I say, is most innovations in transport have come from historic towns for the simple reason they're forced to. They get the traffic problems first before anyone else does. They get all the tourists, so they have to innovate. They're, they're, so they have innovated, and they've led the way in just about every aspect of transport, except perhaps um, the sort of high-tech end of transport. They haven't led it there. The guided buses, for example. Uh, oh, well, hang on, I missed that one. Oh, no, that's, uh, that, incidentally, is Derry, London Derry, uh, where I had a, a very enjoyable study there. And this is um, Italy, where they know how to do pedestrianisation properly and look at the quality of the urban design uh, in that and compare it with, I don't know what your nearest one, Exeter, compare it with a sort of English bodge-up job uh, for uh, pedestrianisation. The Italians are brilliant at design and they're not afraid to do it. They take great pride in doing it. Um, now, this is Galway. And this chap is just about to be taught that you can no longer um, get in your car at home and drive into town and park on the pavement for as long as you like. And despite that there's a double yellow line there, you're still parked, not even on the road, on the pavement. So he's going to get a fine, which is good. Um, and so parking control and enforcement is the first thing you have to do if you're going to manage traffic at all. Um, in Italy, of course, they've got even better defences against the car. Half their town has got wonderful city walls like this, and they keep the cars out and kindly place uh, underground parking with a lift uh, just outside the city wall. So there it is. Uh, we couldn't afford to do that. I can't think of any of our historic towns that have done anything like that, but they have done park and ride and things like that. But uh, Italians, you have to take your hat off to them. When they do things, they do do them properly. Uh, so here's a UK, this is Chester's Park and Ride, and you can see the great acres of cars. Uh, when you leave your car there, uh, you've got to pay for it, you've got to get, collect some, sell, get some money. Then you've got to hike over to this sort of pavilion, peculiar thing, looks a bit like an Austrian um, <laughs> church or something, I don't know why it has to be looked like that, but it does. Uh, and you sit down and wait there for the bus, and the bus will eventually take you into one point, usually only in the city centre. Um, park and Ride has the interesting feature, uh, in some places, that it works both ways. I used to go in and out of Oxford quite a lot when they'd introduced their Park and Ride, which is over here, and I was surprised to see people waiting the other side of the road, and I thought, they're fools, they must have not realised the sights on the other side. So they, I just stopped and told one, you'd get, it's over there. And then I discovered, no, there's also a park and ride running in the opposite direction to London. So they were waiting, they were dropped off, they were leaving their bus, their car over on the park and ride site, and instead of riding into Oxford, they were riding into London, uh, which was a bit of a shock for British Rail, who's supposed to be in that market. Right, we'll begin now, we're done with walking, so cycling. This is London, these are cyclists, and the first thing I note about the picture, which I'm sure you note too, is uh, they're all terrified. They're all terrified of being on bikes uh, and afraid they're going to get hit. And some of them look as they might be hit in that picture. So they wear brightly coloured clothes um, and they also wear helmets. I think helmets are now obligatory for cyclists in London. So um, that's the first thing about how people perceive cycling. Again, if you go to Italy, they know how to do it much better. These are cyclists. They haven't got silly coloured jackets on. They haven't got silly hats on. They're cycling along, chatting to each other um, quite happily, and not getting in anyone's way, they're not killing anyone. There's a lot of park bikes around which aren't very pretty. But um, basically, again, the Italians have just done it a different way and I think a rather better way than, than we have. But we've, we've done quite a lot of cycling. 
But if you want to really see cycling uh, and how it can be done, uh, you have to go to China. I was lucky to get invited out to be a consultant to the Shanghai government uh, and took that food up. The first morning I was there, I opened my window, looked at I couldn't believe what I saw. I couldn't believe the volume of cycling. It's by far the major form of movement in terms of the numbers of people, kilometers covered per day is bicycle. Uh, in, uh, <laughs> here, be, that'll be way down the list. Um, and the other interesting thing to note about, they're not racing like we do. They're not herring along dressed in funny clothes. They're all just pedaling along quietly. Sometimes you even see them chatting to each other as they're on bikes, they're sort of saying hello. Um, and this photo I took to try to persuade the mayor of Shanghai, who was my client, that it wasn't very sensible to uh, close this lane to bikes and convert it to cars as he proposed. He seriously said, uh, you know, close that damn cycle lane, we have another car lane, much better. And we had a long argument with him and said, you know, I think there are rather more people in this lane than in that lane, and therefore it would be silly to close this one. And eventually he accepted that and reversed the decision. But it was a battle, because they, you know, they just love cars, they all wanted to use cars. Um, again, Italy is interesting, but not particularly uh, wonderful in its handling of the motorcycle problem. Because they love riding around on their mopeds, we don't because it's so damn wet and cold here. But they all ride them, you get, it cools you down. Uh, and uh, the parking, again, total chaos in Italy. Um, again, back to China, uh, and just note that uh, women use bikes as well as men, and they even take their children on them back. So everything's really geared up to it in China, uh, and even freight moves in China on bicycles in quite a substantial volume. <laughs> you can see, I don't know how this man could see where he was going. He was on his own, he at least got three wheels on his bike, but um, he was shifting a whole lot of stuff. And you see it all the time, that sort of thing going on. Right, so now we come to buses and back to our local, locally generated millionaire, Harry Blundard, who was the first to buy his own bus company out when Mrs. Thatcher privatized them. Uh, and the first thing he did was a very revolutionary idea. He put in doors uh, on the buses so that he could board the passengers quickly. He didn't want his buses hanging around at stops while people sorted out the right money and picked up the dog and so on. So he put two doors. And he also put, used much smaller buses. So he went for fast boarding times and frequent services. He knew exactly what the passengers wanted. Um, and that's Harry. I did the wrong one there. Uh, so we next come to bus lanes. Every, all motorists hate bus lanes because they say, well, look, they're taking up valuable capacity from the cars and uh, they you know, cause congestion and they stop us parking where we were parked for years. Um, and I include this photo because it, it just by chance, I took it when I was riding on top of a double-decker bus, not for any particular purpose, but when I looked at it, I realized that it got a whole lot of lessons in it on what to do and what not to do. Um, the first of these is, the bus is working. Look, the bus has disappeared off down the road. It's got through the congestion, so the, the lane is working. Uh, but secondly, it's not too bad for pedestrians because he's got a refuge, so he doesn't have to look two ways when he's crossing the road. He looks one way. Uh, he's still having to look at the bus lane and the other traffic, but it makes it a lot safer. Um, the bus stop is built out so that the as Motorists love to do, if there is congestion, they love to trap the bus in the bus stop and then it can't get out and they sort of, you know, uh, serves you right, being a bus. So that's a, a key design element for bus lanes. Um, and then the other thing is the cars are off the road, off the main track, if they park. So they get locked in by the bus, exactly the opposite. So it's a, a clever bit of design and they've got about just about everything right there. Uh, now we come on to historic towns, and of course what people really want in historic towns is no buses at all, and if we've got to have public transport, can we please have trams? And on the continent, they get them in huge numbers. All the big tram systems are on the continent. We've now got one, we've got one in Croydon, you know, which is more like a railway than a tram. Um, 
but they replace buses in the continent. And I used to think, well, there's no advantage of a tram at all, it's just like a bus. What's the value of it? And I did various inquiries against tram schemes, I think, in Glasgow was when I defeated the tram, um, which was, I got the wrong end of the stick. Trams, I think, are rather good. The main reason is um, you don't park on a tram line. You know the tram can't move, so unless you're really bonkers, you don't park your car on a tram line. So the tram doesn't suffer from congestion in the way the bus does. Uh, trams can be all sorts of sizes. I think this is Ghent or somewhere like that in uh, Holland. And look, there's a gigantic new one going that way and a tiny old-fashioned little one going the other way. So, and we love them all. You know, we, love, we love the old ones uh, and we love the brand new ones. And uh, we love the articulated ones, that brand new one's articulated. So, and some of them are little trains in Holland. Right, now we come to the next main policy option, which is to squeeze out the car, to, to have areas where the car uh, either can't get in or has got to pay to get in. In other words, we're into the area of what we call road pricing. And this is the famous bollard in Durham, the first road pricing scheme anywhere in the world. Very simple. You can drive in to Durham if you want, to, no problem at all. Everyone's welcome to drive in. But if you want to get out again, you've got to put a pound in that slot machine. That halved the traffic in Durham, or no, more than halved the traffic in Durham overnight when that scheme went in. That was only one, one road closure. So it opened up the whole idea of road pricing, something that was absolutely taboo, uh, still is taboo to people like the AA, uh, weren't here of it, uh, but there it is, it works. Um, and that was the result. The centre of Durham virtually cleared of traffic. Once the cars were gone, you could still have delivery vehicles, no trouble. I think they limited them to certain times of the day. Uh, but once they were gone, the, it was a pedestrian area and completely transformed. And of course, all the shopkeepers who'd opposed it like mad suddenly found they were making a lot more money than they were before. So the shopping turnover shot up in Durham. And it has done everywhere that's pedestrianised has increased its retail. Um, uh, they kindly put on a cathedral bus. I don't think that, that illustrates any more than that. I think of God occasionally. Um, now, what else can we do with a bus? We've got this wonderful thing, but it's a bit old-fashioned and so on. So what can we do to upgrade it? Well, a very clever Dutch invention is you can relieve the driver of the need to steer. He can sit there, but he doesn't actually have to touch the steering wheel. So that's not a great technical breakthrough. But this is. This one hasn't got a driver at all. And this bus has operated for something like 12 years on this route, uh, and it's never hit anybody. Uh, the only thing is that cyclists have decided they should be using it as well, and so they follow the bus, and they even overtake the bus. The Dutch being the Dutch, you know what they're like. Um, they've taken advantage of it, and why not? It, it's got the capacity for that. So, not a great scientific advance, but quite a clever one. That's, that's the, when you get in, you just press the stop you want, and the bus then stops at that stop, otherwise it doesn't bother. Uh, the next breakthrough is much more significant. This is the man I'd hoped would come today, but he's not made it, has he? Uh, Martin Lawson, professor at uh, Bristol University, invented what's called the Personal Rapid Transit, PRT. It's essentially a little cab, which you can share with other people if you want to. Uh, you get in it, you dial where you want to go, you just press the button, where you want to go, and it then takes you non-stop on its own network of tracks to the place you want to go. So it is much faster than a car because you don't have to park it. Uh, it's much safer because it can't hit anything else. It might fall off its perch, I suppose. But, but essentially, a fantastic development. And I went, I had a development client uh, in the Nottingham area at that time, and he said he was putting up a big development of new housing on the edge of town and he said to me um, I am having no buses in this development, not doing any buses at all, they lower the tone this is for posh people we, that was his attitude, he was from Northern Ireland he was joking a bit but essentially that was what he was saying so I thought well I said well I haven't got anything I've got buses, you know, minibuses, no 
I offered him all, everything I could think of. And um, eventually I met Lawson and he showed me p uh, pictures of his thing. And I thought, that's not entirely crazy, he's quite good. So he said, well, come down and look at the test track. So I went down with the Irishman from um, uh, Midlands. Uh, and uh, we looked at the test track, this was it. Uh, it's built just in an industrial area at Cardiff, still there. Um, and the Irishman was offered a, a trip on the bus. So he rather reluctantly got in. And uh, the thing on, on the PRT system. And he went off. And he hadn't gone very far. It was raining quite heavily. Uh, and uh, his vehicle broke down. And they were stuck right up on the elevated section. Uh, and I thought, well, that's it. <laughs> I, was right, I was right. And um, what happened next was a party went off walking up the ramp after the vehicle. And they just picked it up and moved it a bit. It had just gone slightly off course. Uh, and it, he got back in and off they went. When he got back, I said to him, oh, I think that's cured you of your uh, love of this form of transport, hasn't it? And he said, it's wonderful. Uh, it hadn't at all. He was totally convinced it was right. He went out of business, I think, in the recession, so I haven't seen him for a long time. Uh, but uh, the next thing, of course, was that BAA had built one. Theirs was uh, quite a modest one, but very nicely done, you know, beautifully designed, and uh, not sort of makeshift thing we'd had from Lawson. And basically all it did was it ran from the car park five to terminal five and back. So if you came to terminal, it was a long stay car park. If you came into terminal five, you, instead of once you checked through and got your luggage, you just uh, got in the vehicle, went right round the end of the runway and up to the car park. The, the system even knew where you'd left your car, so it could drop a number of points in the car park. Um, so, you know, to me, incomprehensibly clever uh, technology, but to uh, Lawson, no problems at all. Um, the stations are very simple. Uh, here are the cars. You just walk into that, and the vehicle arrives, its doors open, you get in, you don't have to say where you want to go, it knows, uh, and uh, it works just like a shuttle. They had plans to extend it. At the moment, it runs from Terminal 5 to this area here. And the plan was to extend it right along to the end. Uh, and it's been highly successful. It's earned the money. Um, but I sat next to the head of BAA recently at some dinner. And I said, when are you going to extend it and finish the job? And he said, um, my job is airplanes, not inventing new transport systems. Which I thought was a pretty feeble excuse. But anyway, at the moment, it's not going to be extended. It's bound to be extended in the end. It should, in my view, go right around the whole airport and serve all the adjacent rail stations and underground stations. And it would hugely reduce traffic then. Uh, well, there are the vehicles. Um, and the next thing, of course, before Lawson had hardly finished, the Dutch had invented an almost identical one. And it's, it's not actually cribbed, but it's an incredibly close copy. And they're now selling it all over the world. And Lawson is uh, still not got another one, not got another sale. And he is the man who invented it. It's typical British. I mean, the Dutch aren't usually, they're usually quite friendly people, but they certainly outflanked Lawson in a terrible way. I started saying, right, we'll, um, am I, right, okay. As we'll put them into some of our transport proposals for new towns. And for some reason, New towns were getting a lot of flack, even though they were designed for the car. Some of them already got too many. Um, so I started uh, producing designs for park and ride systems, so PRT systems. And that one is uh, Daventry, I think. Uh, and that, the blue lines are the bus. And um, no, I forget which way around it is. The, the, it must be the red lines are the bus, and the blue are the P and R park and ride, PRT. All uh, right. Uh, and that was the layout of stations. So it covered the whole town. Nowhere was more than about uh, 100 metres from a stop. So everyone could get the, these things and be taken to any other station they wanted to do non-stop. So it's a pretty good transport system. It would certainly be preferable to a car because you wouldn't have to park it. You wouldn't have to pay.
pay so much money. Um, anyway, that was quickly thrown out as being completely impractical and a silly invention by British people who should know better. Um, the station layout, very simple, just have a couple of, a little lay-by really, and a few uh, sawtooth bays. Uh, Roger, I think, drew this picture of wh what an elevated one would look like. No, he didn't. Some of um, you know, you can either have it at grade or elevated, or you can have it in tunnel if you must. But it's expensive if you put it in tunnel. At grade, it is much cheaper than building a road. Uh, elevated, I think, it's even cheaper than uh, no, probably not. I think it would be more expensive. Um, now, the question arose then, how do you forecast the use of these things? I'll take this quickly, it's a bit technical. Um, uh, you, you can just read them. And the bottom then, you put your results in the Department of Transport lays down how transport projects are evaluated, whether it be the channel tunnel or a bus lane. Air, all procedures are laid down, you're told exactly what values of time to use, for example, and so on. Um, so the results are put in this department's evaluation uh, procedure. And don't bother to read this table, just look at the bottom. Um, yes, yeah, the bottom figure. That shows the relative costs of PRT and uh, the car. And you can see that the PRT system requires much less investment than the car. Uh, Equally, in terms of comparing it with the bus, uh, the PRT is much cheaper, somewhere between four and six uh, million pounds against uh, a car. If you consider, depends on what, what people consider PRT. If they think of it as being like a car, uh, then it's that end. And if they think of it as being like a bus, then it's that end. We don't even really know what people will make of it. But my view is they're more like to think of it as a, as a car than a bus. The important thing in this work for Daventry was uh, this table, again, it's slightly long, but it's working out uh, what percentage of people will use cars um, and what percent will use public transport. So you only need to look at those columns. Uh, and you can see there that um, with the PRT, one was getting a mode share of between 67 and 78%. Whereas with a car, you're right up close to 100% are using car, are choosing to use cars. <coughs> um, so the public transport share, if you take the bus as well, uh, is going from 4% if everybody uh, tends to pick the car as they will do, uh, to 20, 33% if you have a PRT. So a PRT looks as though it would be far more effective in getting people out of cars than a bus ever can be. Benefit-cost ratio, an astonishing 5.2. The Department of Transport insists on benefit-cost ratio greater than 1. So 5.2 would be something they've never seen before. And again, only one figure here, which I won't bore you with. The 52.9 million, I compare with the cost of constructing the thing. And it, it doesn't fully pay for it, but it gets very, very close to producing enough revenue to pay for the whole system without you and I having to pay taxes. The other point is what we call the planning benefit. What impact does it have on the town if you have a PRT? And this one's quite interesting. Um, it shows you that the blue areas where you have PRT become much more attractive to developers than the areas that have to be served by car. So the conclusions of that study were you could enormously improve public transport, far uh, better than it is now. Uh, PRT can do a far greater improvement than, than you'll ever achieve with bus. Uh, and it can probably do it commercially. That's the amazing thing which civil servants cannot understand. Whereas buses will certainly have to be subsidised. Uh, and PRT can also help somewhere like a new town to develop in the way you want it to develop and not just sprawl all over the place. Uh, so get ahead and do it was our result. So what are the roles do we see emerging? First of all, I see PRT coming into the expansion of towns and enabling those expansions to take place without causing additional traffic. I see them as behaving like taxi systems in centre of urban areas. Uh, and I see them as boosting the travel by rail because they will improve the catchment areas of stations. So pretty important. 
uh, and I see them enabling supermarkets to move back into town centres. They'll still need their parking, but you can nip in to do your shopping with PRT, bring your shopping back right to your car, uh, and that would save an awful lot of time. So next park and ride, this is Chester, uh, uh, Britain's first park and ride system, beautifully done, nice landscaping, so I only wait, wait for the bus. Um, and park and ride is the last sort of important role for PRT. It would do that job far better than uh, a bus ever can. Now, St Earth Park and Ride, a lovely scheme. I visited it the other day with Roger. Uh, you'll know that it's an extension of the parking. I mean, it's removing some of the parking and converting it to park and ride. Uh, you get better facilities, a visitor centre, you get better disabled access. You get a rail-based park and ride as well. Uh, and there could be bus park and ride to other places, including Hale and Penzance. You get better signing, uh, and it seems generally to me a pretty good scheme. That's the end. Sorry to end rather abruptly, but uh, it is. And sorry to go on so long. Anyway.